Right. Um, next lecture here is is um, from Artem. Um, next to the fact that he's, uh, uh, how would I spell it? Earning a <laughs> earning a nice amount of money probably at a at a lab that's quite renowned in the world as Kaspersky. And from that point on, um, he's not just looking in this lecture to exploit uh, development for uh, Cisco stuff. We all suffered from this last year, or we all heard about it, and don't know the impact maybe, but he's gonna explain us the work he did on that field. Um, so please, can I ask you all a warm welcoming applause for Artem Kodradenko? Do you... Uh... Okay, good. <laughs> please give him a warm applause and start. Hello everyone, um, so excited to finally be able to attend KS Communication Congress. Very happy to see you all. So without further ado, let's jump into some practical iOS exploitation. So um, a few words about myself. Uh, my name is Artem. Uh, I do stuff, mostly security related stuff, but mostly my areas of expertise are penetration tests, both internal and external, and also do research in my free time. And um, a bit of bug bounty here and there. And this talk is actually kind of a um, continuation of my uh, talk this summer at DEF CON about Cisco Catalyst exploitation. So uh, for those of you who are out of context, let's recap what happened earlier this year. So uh, year 2017 uh, was reaching uh, vulnerabilities for Cisco iOS. Uh, devices. So we had at least three major advisories uh, for Cisco iOS that represented three remote code execution vulnerabilities. So the first one is a vulnerability in cluster management protocol, which uh, resulted in unauthenticated um, remote code, execu code execution via Telnet. Second one is SNMP overflow and uh, DHCP uh, remote code execution. Uh, in this lecture, I'll be, I'm going to be talking about two of those vulnerabilities because DHCP, uh, RCE, is uh, yet to be researched. So hopefully by uh, the end of this talk, I'm going to be able to show you a live demo of exploiting the SNMP service in Cisco iOS. So, um, but first, what happened uh, earlier? So on March 26, uh, 2017, uh, we had a major advisory from Cisco that um, announcing that hundreds of models of different switches are vulnerable to remote code execution vulnerability. No public code, uh, no public exploit was available and uh, no exploitation in the wild. So it was critical and the uh, main points of the vulnerability uh, were as follows. So uh, Cisco switches can be clustered uh, and there's um, a uh, cluster management protocol built on top of Telnet. And uh, this vulnerability is a result of actually two errors, a logic error and a bi binary error. So uh, the Telnet options uh, get parsed uh, regardless whether the switch is in cluster mode or not. And the incorrect uh, processing of this uh, cluster uh, management protocol options result in um, overflow. So what is interesting about this vulnerability that actually the source uh, of research for Cisco guys was uh, another internal research, but the Vault 7 leak that happened uh, in March this year. So m many hacking uh, techniques and uh, tools were uh, released to public uh, by WikiLeaks and among many vendors that were affected uh, was Cisco systems. So basically, um, Except for, for the advisory, you could, you could go to WikiLeaks and read about this uh, potential exploitation technique for Cisco uh, Catalyst. So basically, these were notes of an engineer who was testing the actual exploit. Um, there were no ex explo actual exploit uh, in the leak. So basically, uh, this worked as follows. There was uh, two modes of interaction. So for example, an attacker could connect to the Telnet, uh, over, uh, overflow the service, and be presented with a privileged 15 shell. The other mode of uh, operation was the um, 
uh, is to set uh, for all the subsequent connect connections to the telnet, uh, there will be credential without credentials. So I did rediscover this exploit. Uh, full research was presented, uh, presented at DEF CON 25. Uh, I was targeting Cisco Catalyst to 2660 uh, as a target switch. Um, I also described a PowerPC platform exploitation and uh, the way you can debug it. Uh, you can uh, look at my, my blog post about uh, exploiting this service and also the uh, proof of concept exploit uh, on my GitHub page. But today, uh, I want to talk about something else, about another vulnerability that was announced uh, this year uh, about SNMP remote code execution. So the actual motivation uh, behind this uh, research was that uh, I was conducting an external pen test, and uh, it was um, revealed, an NMAP scan revealed that a Cisco router with a default community uh, shrink was available. So the goal was to uh, get access to the internal network. Um, so the actual advisory said that the attacker uh, needs a read-only community string to gain remote code execution on the device. Uh, the target router was a 2800 uh, integrated services router, uh, which is a very common device uh, on the networks. Uh, so the technical specs for it is um, it's, uh, it has a MIPS big engine architecture. Uh, you don't have any client uh, debugging tools for it available. Uh, and it's interesting in that sense that uh, the firmware is relatively new for this router. And uh, it might be interesting to look at the defensive and exploit prevention mechanisms uh, employed uh, by Cisco iOS. When I say relatively new, is that uh, interesting thing is that uh, this device is actually end of support. It's not supported. So the last patch for it was uh, came out at uh, 2016. And uh, to remind you, the advisory for SNMP overflow appeared in 2017, in June 2017. But nonetheless. Uh, this is still a widely used device. If you uh, search for SNMP banner on Shodan, you will uh, find at least 3,000 uh, devices with SNMP service uh, available with default public string. So these devices are all uh, supposedly vulnerable to SNMP overflow. Uh, the question is uh, whether we can uh, build a remote code execution exploit for it. So. Since we're going to be exploiting uh, SNMP protocol, let's make a quick rec uh, recap of, uh, of how it works. Just a light touch. So SNMP uh, comes with um, several abbreviations, like uh, MIB, which stands for Management Information Base, and is kind of a collection of uh, objects that can be monitored from the SNMP manager. And so Management Information Base actually consists of object identifiers uh, and as an example, you all know that uh, printers uh, usually use SNMP. For example, if there is a certain level of ink in the cartridge, you can query the SNMP service on this uh, device uh, for the percentage of ink left. So that's uh, kind of example how it works. Um, management information uh, base uh, looks like a tree. So you have your base element at the top and your leaf elements. So all these elements uh, represent an object that uh, could be queried. We're going to be looking at get request. And that is why um, the advisory states that for the vulnerability to be triggered, you only have to know the read-only community string. So uh, it's a relatively um, simple protocol. You just supply the object identifier, uh, identifier you're querying, and you'll get back the result. So here, for example, we get um, the router version, the description field. And you can also uh, do this with uh, readily available Linux tools like SNMP get. So before um, we'll, um, we will build an exploit, uh, we have a starting point. So how do we look for, for the crash? So the advisory actually states that um, there are nine different uh, vulnerable management information bases. And you only have to know the read-only community string. So um, for the fuzzing to be done, I'll be using uh, SCAPI as a, tool to, as a toolkit to work with network protocols. And here you can see that I'm building an object identifier, a valid object identifier that um, 
references the description field, and then I'm appending some uh, letters A, which is 65 in an ASCII table. Then I build an IP packet, I build a UDP packet, and uh, SNM SNMP uh, packet inside of it with community string public and uh, object identifier. So, uh, of course, this will not trigger the overflow because this uh, object identifier is completely fine. How do we get all the uh, object identifiers that our router uh, will uh, respond to? So basically, there are two ways. You can uh, take the firmware and uh, just extract all the uh, OIDs from it. It's easy to grab them. They're stored in plain text. Uh, another way is to actually uh, look at the vulnerable MIPS and uh, visit the website uh, OID views and get the all uh, get all object identifiers from this website. So, um, as a matter of fact, uh, the first crash I had was in uh, Cisco Alps MIP, uh, which is uh, kind of related to airplane uh, protocol, which uh, does not concern uh, concern us because uh, it's not a focus uh, of our exploitation. So, uh, the actual uh, overflow was uh, in one of its uh, object identifiers. So this uh, request, this OID actually crashed uh, the router. When you connect uh, to the Cisco router of, uh, via a serial cable, uh, you will be, uh, and there's a crash, you will be presented with a stack trace. So we see here that uh, we got a corrupted program counter, and we also see um, uh, the state of registers uh, that we have uh, at the moment of crash. So here uh, you can see uh, that we have uh, control of a program counter. Uh, it's called EPC. And also we control the contents of registers S0, S1, S2, S3, S4, S5, S6. Uh, further inspection also uh, provided me with knowledge that we have uh, 60 spare bytes uh, on the stack to work with. But before uh, we build the exploit, we have some uh, problems, issues uh, to be solved. And that is, yes, we do control the program counter, but where do we jump to? Is ASLR on? Uh, and can we execute shellcode directly on the stack? Uh, is stack executable if we can place the shellcode on it? Uh, is data caching um, a problem for us? And if, we're, uh, if we uh, launch our shell code, can we just patch the code? Is the code section writable? Is the code integrity check on? But the most important question is how can we uh, return the code flow back to the SNMP service? Because iOS is a single binary uh, running in the memory. And if you have an exception in any thread of this big binary, uh, the Cisco device uh, will crash. And if we look at the advisory, one of the indicators of compromise, uh, as Cisco states, is um, device reload. So exploitation of the vulnerabilities will cause an affected device to reload. Um, we will build an exploit, we'll try to build an exploit that will not crash the SNMP service on it. Before we dive deeper into the firmware, I want to reference uh, previous researches on this matter. Um, this is by no means uh, a complete list. Uh, but this research has actually uh, helped me a lot uh, and seem interesting and very insightful to me. Uh, you should definitely check them out. Um, so for example, Router Exploitation by Felix Li uh, FX uh, Lindener and uh, Cisco IOS Shellcode by George Nasenko is a great resource for uh, iOS internals and great reference to how uh, iOS uh, works in terms of exploitation. And uh, the third resource, How to Cook Cisco, uh, is a great uh, info on exploiting PowerPC-based uh, Cisco switches and also great info on bypassing common me uh, mechanisms and exploit prevention stuff in iOS. So basically, if I were to tell you uh, how iOS uh, works in one slide. It's basically a single binary running in, uh, in memory. Everything is statically linked into a single um, ELF file which uh, gets loaded on startup. Of course, you have no API whatsoever. Everything is, um, has no symbols whatsoever. 
Yes, there is a glibc library at the end of the firmware, but it's also kind of hard to use it because uh, you have so many different uh, different ver versions of firmware and the offset offsets jump and you don't know uh, the exact location of those functions. So to start with static analysis, uh, you should probably copy the firmware from the in, uh, flash memory of the router, use the copy command. It supports TFTP and FTP protocols. Um, so you download the firmware. The next thing you do is unpack the firmware. The firmware itself, when the router starts loading it, has an initial stop uh, that does the unpacking. But you don't have to reverse engineer that. You just uh, use Beanwalk that will, uh, will do the unpacking for you. Uh, you load the, the result of unpacking with Beanwalk into IDA Pro. Uh, you have to change the processor type to a MIPS 32 bit Andean. And we know that uh, this is MIPS because uh, we saw the registers. Uh, this uh, registers tell us uh, that uh, it was indeed MIPS architecture. So one thing uh, I want to note. The actual firmware gets loaded into address 800F00, but the program counter is located uh, at address 4. And this is because uh, iOS, when it uh, loaded the firmware, transfers, I mean, uh, maps the memory to 400F00. And this is important because uh, to have correct cross-references in IDA Pro, you have to rebase your program to 4. And after that, uh, you will have uh, uh, all correct string cross-references. You will have uh, all the necessary strings, and your uh, static analysis uh, setup will be complete. But in order to uh, build an exploit, um, it will not suffice to only have the, you know, IDA Pro loaded with the firmware with all the cross references. You probably want to, uh, you know, set up a debug environment. It is well known that iOS can be debugged via a serial port. Um, and actually, there is a GDB kernel command uh, that is used to start the internal GDB server. Or it was because uh, functionality was removed. Uh, in the recent versions of iOS, and you can't really run the JDB. But nonetheless, uh, there's a way to enable the JDB. And this way is to reboot the device, uh, send an escape sequence to the serial um, line. This will uh, bring up the ROM monitor shell. So ROM monitor is a simple piece of firmware that gets loaded and run just before your firmware starts uh, running. And in this uh, ROM one, you can manually boot your firmware with a flag N, which uh, will launch the whole firmware under uh, GDB. And uh, after your firmware is loaded, uh, the GDB will kick in. Now, you can just use your uh, favorite GDB debugger and Linux and connect it uh, to iOS. Uh, via ser uh, serial port, because iOS uses uh, a slightly different uh, subset of commands of uh, GDB protocol. It's, it has a server side GDB, but uh, the client side uh, should be uh, accustomed to this GDB server. Basically, there is no uh, publicly av uh, and officially available uh, client side debugging, debugging tools for iOS, and that is because uh, this is intended for uh, Cisco engineers uh, for, uh, to be done. Although there have been uh, some efforts from the community to build tools uh, to debug uh, several versions of routers and switches uh, uh, with iOS. And if you look for ways to debug uh, Cisco iOS, you will find, um, you most definitely will find a tutorial um, that says that you, you can actually patch an old version of GDB that still supports iOS, but it actually never works because I tried it and all I could do is read memory, the stepping, the tracing, uh, it, it just doesn't work. So another um, way is to, use, is to use a cool tool by uh, NCC Group. It's called iAdit. Uh, it's a graphical debugger for iOS. It, it really works. It's a, it's a great tool. But the thing is, it it is only uh, it targets PowerPC architecture, and um, it has some uh, some problems. You probably have to patch the debugger to be able to work with it. 
And the third option, the last resort, is to implement your own debugger for, uh, for the router. Uh, and to do that, you have to know uh, which commands actually uh, Cisco supports, and not a lot. So you can basically read memory uh, and write memory, and set and write registers. And the only uh, program counter control command is a step instruction. Uh, so basically, it's kind of easy to implement uh, such a debugger because all the information is just sent uh, as a plain text over a serial cable uh, and appended with a checksum, uh, which is just a CRC. So this way, uh, I was able to you know, make a quick uh, sc Python script using uh, Capstone to be able to debug iOS. You can inspect registers. Uh, there's a basic uh, breakpoint management. You just uh, write a special control uh, double word to be able to break. You can store a step over, step into, and also a uh, good feature is to be able to dump memory, which we will use later. So uh, to find the overflow, the SNMP overflow in the code, uh, how do you do it? Basically, you can follow, since we have all the string cr cross-references, you can follow the string strings that reference SNMP get request and just step until, you, uh, until the crash. But a more efficient method is just to crash the device and start inspecting the stack after the device is already uh, crashed. You just have to dump some memory on the stack, uh, looking into the values that reference the code. Uh, some of them will be return addresses, and this uh, will give you a hint uh, uh, where the crash uh, actually is. So the actual program counter uh, corruption happens in the function epilogue. I call this function SNMP st uh, stack overflow. So you can see here that um, at the end of, uh, of a function, we load uh, the values from the stack to registers, S0 to S6, and also we uh, load value into register RA. And this is an important register. It's called a return address register, and almost every function in MIPS uses this register to uh, jump back uh, to its parent function. So basically, we have, uh, we have uh, some space on the stack. Uh, but the question is, can we place our shellcode uh, on, uh, on the stack? And can we execute it? Uh, because uh, you know, stack location is unpredictable. Every time you trigger this vulnerability, a separate um, space on the stack is allocated, and you cannot really predict it. So uh, no valid uh, jump to stack instructions in the firmware like we did on uh, Intel X86, uh, like jump ESP. No such instructions in the firmware, but even if we could find such instruction, um, the address space layout uh, randomization is on, which means the code section and uh, data section is based on different offset each time we reboot the device, which means that we can reliably uh, jump to the instruction. And also, an unfortunate thing is that uh, data caching uh, is also um, in place. So, about ASLR, this is the first uh, first time I encountered uh, the randomization um, in iOS. Previous researches uh, uh, that that I've been dealing with, they uh, said a lot about diversity of the firmware. So basically, you had so many different versions of firmware when you exploited the Cisco device. It couldn't really reliably jump to any code because there's so uh, vast diversity of uh, different firmware that was built by different people. But here we actually have the stack uh, address space randomization, and the text section and data section is loaded uh, different offset after each uh, reboot. So another thing that really upsets us is data caching. So when we uh, write our shell code to stack, we think that it will be on the stack. But what actually happens, uh, everything gets written into data cache. And when we place our program counter to the stack, uh, we get uh, executing uh, garbage instructions, which results uh, in a crash once again. So this, this is 
basically a data execution prevention. Well, it's not. It's a, it's a cache. But uh, the solution to this problem is the same as for data execution prevention. And it is uh, return-oriented programming. So, uh, but unfortunately, we still have ASLR, so we, uh, we can't really jump to uh, anything because it's uh, on random offset. But here, the raw monitor that I was talking about uh, comes to our rescue. So, this little piece of software that gets loaded before the actual firmware uh, might actually help us. So, the first thing we uh, want to find where this uh, bare bones uh, firmware is located, and uh, the interesting feature of this uh, Raman shell it's actually uh, allowing you to disassemble arbitrary memory parts, uh, and if you target the disassembler at an invalid address, you will get a stack trace uh, revealing the actual address of the ROM monitor. And what's uh, the most in interesting thing? as yes, the RAM monitor is located at BFC all zeros, uh, and you can dump it um, using the debugger. Or you can just search the internet for uh, the version and download it. The most interesting part about this uh, piece of firmware is uh, that um, RAM monitor is located at the same address, and it's persistent across reboots. Uh, it's really great because we can use it for uh, building uh, ROP chains inside of it. So now we have a theoretical um, possibility of circumventing ASLR and defeating uh, the cache problem. So how do we uh, build an exploit? So the overview is as follows. We jump to ROM1. We, uh, make an, uh, uh, we initiate a ROP chain, which makes an arbitrary write uh, using the code reuse technique. And after that, we have to uh, recover the stack frame to allow the SNMP service to uh, restore the legitimate call flow. This is really important because we want uh, we will be writing only four bytes, uh, and that is not enough uh, for a full-fledged shellcode. And if we don't crash SNMP, we can exploit uh, this vulnerability over and over, uh, over again, thus uh, building um, shellcode in the memory. So after we build the shellcode, we make a jump to it. So uh, here's um, how it works. We overflow the stack. We overflow the return address, so it points to ROM monitor. We jump to the ROM monitor. Uh, then what we do, we actually find a gadget that um, reuses the data on our stack to make an arbitrary 4-byte write uh, just before uh, the text section. Then we have to find a gadget that will uh, recover stack for us so we can re uh, restore the legitimate SNMP execution call flow. So this is uh, basically an overview of um, one cycle, of how we write a four-byte uh, double word. Now, a little bit on uh, building ROP chains. So what is it? What is return-oriented programming? So basically, the idea is to not execute the shell code directly, but uh, is to use uh, existing code in the binary to execute your payload. So uh, you, uh, you use stack not as a, a source of instructions, but you use uh, stack as a data for the code that you're reusing. So you basically, uh, you s uh, chain the snippets of code we call them gadgets, and uh, you chain them together with uh, jump or uh, call instructions. And um, candidate gadgets uh, has to meet two um, requirements. It has to actually uh, execute our payload, and also it also has to uh, contain instructions that will transfer execution flow to the next gadget. Or uh, if it's the last gadget, it should transfer execution back to the SNMP service. Uh, the problems with the uh, return-oriented uh, approach is that there is a limited set of gadgets available. So if we're talking about the firmware, it's uh, around 200 megabytes of code. So there are plenty of uh, different gadgets there. If we're talking about raw monitor, it's uh, only 500 kilobytes of code. So not a lot of code available. Uh, 
And the second major problem is that uh, gadgets, uh, because most of them are function epilogues, they modify the, modify the stack frame because they um, delete the local variables after they jump back to the parent function. And you, you have to account for that because this uh, might crash uh, the process you are exploiting. Rob chains can be uh, basically uh, forced to do anything, but mostly, uh, most of the times, uh, we do arbitrary memory writes, and uh, this um, actually might lead to arbitrary code execution. So the idea for uh, for uh, looking for gadgets is that you find a gadget that loads data uh, from the stack into the registers. And then you find a second gadget that works with uh, the data in, the, in those registers. For example, you have uh, one register, uh, V0, which contains the uh, value you want to write, and the other gadget, S0, which has the address you want to write to. So uh, we actually uh, want to find gadgets that also load uh, data from uh, stack to the return register so we can jump to the next uh, next gadget. You don't have to uh, f look for these gadgets manually in IDA. And there are a lot of different tools for building uh, rub chains. One of those uh, tools is Rubber. You can find it on GitHub. It's a really handy tool. You just search for the necessary instructions uh, to build uh, the necessary ROP chain. So now, um, the last technical part of how the ROP chains in this particular exploit work, and then we'll get uh, to the demo. So this is uh, how a perfectly, um, you know, healthy stack frame looks like. So you basically have local variables on the stack. You have return address, and also have. Um, stack frame of parent functions underneath the stack frame of our, our vulnerable function. So when we uh, overflow the local variables with our long object identifier, here's what happens. We overflow the um, local variables, and these variables actually uh, partly get written to S0 uh, and S6 uh, general purpose registers. We also, of course, overflow the return address, which will jump for us to run monitor and we also uh, have some 60 bytes uh, after that uh, we overflow the stack frame of the next function and we use that data also for our rub chain what we do here uh, we take the value of um, s0 we control the, va uh, the value of s0 as you remember and we move it to register v0 and that's for only uh, solely pur purpose because uh, there are no other gadgets in uh, ROM monitor that use s0 as a target uh, register to write data so we have to use register v0 uh, after that the most important part is that we load the return address from the ROM data too uh, and also uh, we load the address we will write to uh, from the ROM data too so basically, uh, right now, after this gadget uh, stops executing, we have um, uh, S0 points to a memory we want to write to, and uh, V0 contains the byte, uh, four, contains four bytes we'll be writing just before the code section. So the final uh, gadget that pr is performing the uh, arbitrary write is the gadget that takes the value of uh, register v0 and writes it uh, to a pointer reference it, uh, referenced by uh, register s0. And the last thing it does, it actually uh, transfers the control back to the gadget, which will recover the stack for us. Uh, the most important ga gadgets, it allows us to run the exploit several times. You might have noticed that uh, the previous gadgets actually move the stack pointer uh, 30 uh, bytes in hex uh, down the down the stack, and this actually uh, means that the process that we will return to will crash if we don't point the stack pointer uh, just between two stack frames. We find a gadget that will move the stack pointer 
uh, down to 228 uh, bytes in hex, uh, which will result in a perfectly healthy stack. Also, we load the return address to register uh, RA, uh, and it points to the parent function that called our vulnerable function. So this way, we perform an arbitrary four-byte write. We can uh, do this several times until our shellcode uh, is actually built uh, just before the text section. And the final thing we do, we overflow the stack again and jump uh, to the shellcode. A few words about the shellcode. device I was working with uh, had a telnet service and it had a password. So I designed a simple shell code that will just patch the authentication uh, code flow. So as you can see here, uh, we have a function, a login password check, and the result, which is uh, in v0 register, is checked whether the authentication was uh, successful or not. We can build a shellcode, which, which will just patch uh, this instruction, which checks uh, login password check. And it will allow us to make a credentialless authentication against Telnet service. So what it does, basically, this shellcode uh, inspects the stack and the return address in it to calculate the ASLR offset, because uh, of course, the ASLR is on for the code section, uh, and we want to patch something in it. And uh, after that, it writes a zero, which is a NUP instruction in MIPS, to a call that checks uh, for password for Telnet and also for um, enable password. And uh, then it just jumps back to SNMP service. So now, the long awaited demo. Let's see if I can make it a live demo. All righty. So here we have the serial connection uh, to the device. You can see we have, a, we have a shell. So what we do now, we uh, inspect the password on the Telnet service to make sure it's working as intended. So we see that bad passwords. We don't, don't know the valid password for the device. What we do now uh, is we launch the actual exploit. As parameters, it takes the host, community, and shellcode in hex. So this is the shellcode I was talking about that patches the code flow in authentication. So let's write sudo. So here you see that we initiate writing the four byte sequences into the text section. Basically, this writes the shell code into the memory. So after the exploit finishes this, we just have to jump to the shell code. So let's see. Please do not crash. So, yes. So back to the slides. Tum, tum, tum. 
and of course you can build a shell code that will unset this behavior and uh, patch the process back to enable the password. And on the side notes, uh, how reliably can you exploit uh, this vulnerability? So of course the SNMP uh, public community will uh, leak you the version of the particular router, but it does not leak you the version of ROM1. And we're basically constructing ROM chains um, in the ROM monitor. So actually, you have not that many versions of ROM monitors available. You have only five if we're talking about uh, 2800 uh, router. So the worst case scenario is just you, you crash it four times. Uh, it's not like you have to crash it 4,000 times to you know, beat the ASLR. But there's a second option, uh, which is interesting. Uh, Raman is designed to be upgraded. So basically, a system administrator can uh, download a new version and update it. But the thing is that the only region that contains the stock Raman is always in place. And it is always uh, at the same offset. So even if you updated the ROM monitor, uh, the read-only version of it, the old version that always been there, will always be at uh, BFC uh, all zeros. So basically, um, the assumption is that all the devices manufactured at the same time and place, they will have the same read-only uh, ROM monitor. You can query uh, your serial number uh, of your router using SNMP GET. So, for example, my uh, lab router is manufactured in the year of 2008 in Czech Republic. So, and it has uh, the following version of ROM monitor. So, guys, to you know, to summarize about all this, do not leave default credentials on external networks. So, public communities are not designed to be placed uh, on external networks uh, for the showdown to find it. Take care of what you exposed on the external networks. Uh, of course, patch uh, your devices and uh, watch for the end of life announcement by Cisco. I'm sorry? Sure, <laughs> why not? All right, guys, uh, thank you so much for your attention. Thanks for having me. <laughs> I suppose there are some questions uh, in this audience. Please take a microphone if you can. No one on the internet. They are uh, flabbergasted here, it seems. No? <laughs> microphone number one. Hi, I'm a random uh, network admin, and I know that uh, people tend to use the same SNMP community on many of their routers. Um, my view is that basically if you can get access to uh, read-only on those routers, you will be able to hijack that or like use the same principle. So basically, don't use the same SNMP community on all your devices. That would be also something. Uh, the main thing is to update your routers because it's a patched vulnerability. The patch was released in September of 2017. But if you tend to use the end-of-life products like uh, router 2800, you probably uh, should use a strong community strength for it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Someone else having a question there? Yes, someone on the internet is alive. It's alive. <laughs> Let's try it. Yeah, now I've actually got a microphone. Uh, the internet is asking, how much time did you put into this whole project? Uh, well, working on this exploit uh, consumed around, uh, I'd say, four weeks. Four weeks from the discovering the uh, device on the external network to the final exploit. Yes. Thank you. I, I have a question maybe for you as well. Is there, you, you, you as well, a lot of, uh, you have lots of volunteers who are working with you as well in, in researching these exploits or? Volunteers? Yeah, I don't know. No, actually we the don't community. have any volunteers. This is all part of my work. Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for uh, Thank you very much for this uh, in this really revealing lecture.
Um, if someone wants to oh, I just, uh, f just forgot to say, is my mic on? Yeah. Okay, so the actual proof of concept and the debugger will be released in a few days. So the Python script with the capstone and the actual proof of concept, I'll publish it in, um, in a week or so. Okay, thank you.